all the US's government satellites, like and most sensitive national security assets are sitting ducks. That has to be solved. And we find the government is now trying to push the timelines as far to the left as possible. They're trying to accelerate everything to get dynamic space operations, like mobility in any form. Refueling, of course, is the obvious one, but they'll try anything they can. They need to be able to move around in orbit. Hey, everyone, and thanks for listening. Today, I'm speaking with Daniel Faber, CEO and co-founder of OrbitFab, a company building gas stations in space. Daniel, thanks for chatting with me today. Real pleasure to be here, David. Yeah, pleasure to have you as well. Uh, no, this is super exciting. I mean, what a cool mission. I love Colorado. I love the space, you know, space industry that's developed and developing here. Uh, so it's great to have a fellow Colorado and company to join. But to kick things off, can you tell us more about, you know, your background and the inspiration for OrbitFab? Sure, absolutely. I uh, I grew up in Tasmania, Australia, um, a small island off the off the bottom of Australia. Went to university in Sydney. Decided that uh, you know, while I was doing engineering, I wanted to do something that was useful for for humanity and and contribute to to, to the world. Uh, and realized that you know, addressing existential risks was uh, was important to me. Uh, getting humans off this rock addresses a bunch of them. So. What would it take to start settling space? Right? What, would, what would it take for the first permanent job in space? That was the question I put to myself. And, and I wrote down a list of industries that could pay for the first permanent jobs in space. That list was tourism and mining. And I decided that I'd have a go at everything related to asteroid mining. So fast forward 25 years, and uh, I built a dozen satellites as an engineer and then started building companies from you know, terrestrial mining instrumentation to high-speed internet where we built the first really compact KA band transponders for, for small satellites, all the kind of bits and pieces that we would need when we get to asteroid mining. But one of the big problems is there's there's no market. And so I was talking to people about what commodities they would use in space. And uh, this is uh, after I just come out of my previous company and was absolutely floored by how much value there is to having an extra kilogram of fuel. It was like the seventh or eighth conversation in a row where I asked the question, like, what is the marginal revenue that you will see if you had one extra kilogram of fuel? And the answer was over a million dollars, which absolutely floored me. Absolutely floored me. Yeah, that was my reaction as well. Seventh or eighth time, and I'm like, I, I have to stop everything else. Like, this is a business that we have to do. That price, that value creation, I mean, it's staggering. And then you start thinking about it and realize, yeah, if you don't have fuel in orbit, you can't move, like, all operations in space because there's nothing to grab onto, everything drifts around. So you've got to use fuel constantly to try and stay in space. And when the fuel is gone, you can't refill a tank, like you throw the satellites away. Or worse, they get stuck in these orbits and they're whizzing around at high speed, risking collisions and, and cluttering up space. It's a huge problem. So this is a problem worth solving. It Here we are. Oh, wow, that's that's pretty cool. Is there a big, you know, you just mentioned mining as, and as you shifted to that, but what was kind of your initial company's like curiosity for that mining? Are you just, you know, you're finding like, where are you mining? What are you trying to get out of there? Just to yeah, segue that, into the refueling. So my, my first startup, I, um, I, I was looking at nuclear fusion research because I, I was uh, running the Canadian Space Society at the time, and we had speakers coming in from interesting topics. So folks with nuclear fusion reactors, uh, hoping that they, would create fusion and then need helium-3, which you might be able to get off the moon. Other folks that were working on gun launch systems to put satellites into, into orbit from, from big guns and, and do that more cost-effectively. Yeah, you know, these are fantastic ideas that people had and were working on. I sort of put the two together and, well, if we could do launch from a gun, like that's a huge high-velocity, high-shock thing, that's kind of like crashing into the moon. And can I put a nuclear sensor on that to then determine what the moon is made of without having to do a soft lander? And if you've seen in the last few months, right, landing on the moon is hard. Crashing into the moon is a lot easier. What if you could just survive the crash? And it turns out you can get electronics to survive if you design them very carefully. And so my first company came out of that. I went to mining companies and said, hey, would you like this? And their response was not really on the crashing side, but tell us more about that instrument thing. We'd really like to know what's in our rocks. And so that 
you know, a couple of pivots later, and I was building a, a box that you could put a rock into, and it would zap the rock with neutrons and get gamma rays off. And then you get the rock back, and it's not radioactive. It's it's all very temporary. It's it's unaffected, so you can put it in again, or you could set it off to a lab for verification. But that was it. Heliocentric technologies became, after a few pivots, instrumentation for the terrestrial mining industry. Uh, we proved it worked. It was fantastic. We had the world's biggest mining company saying, we desperately want this. And then the global financial crisis came along, and no one had money for for tech development. Um, it was insane. So that was the uh, experience of my first startup. Wow. So it's interesting because now we're in the same VC kind of crunch, <laughs> trying to raise capital. <laughs> Has that been um, a problem for you, or is this mission this, resonating with the investors? This is nothing like the financial crisis. I mean, we were we were working with mining companies, and some of the prospective customers we had at the time, their market cap was $20 million, right? Every share, if you bought it at the, the price that it was going on the stock exchange, you could buy the whole company for $20 million. And they had $60 million of cash in the bank. Wow. Now, if you've got a dollar, are you going to give it to a speculative tech startup company? Or are you going to try and buy stocks in these companies that have more cash than their value? It was like it was insane. It was absolutely insane. The world was not. Right now, we're in a contraction, right? And it's a tightening. It is vastly different from the whole financial system breaking. And that's what happened back in 2008, 2009. Good. So you're, you've maneuvered through just fine. With I saw you raised, you know, you got your Series A done earlier this or last year. Yeah. About nine months ago, we uh, we closed up our Series A. It was uh, it was a tough one, I got to say, that's for sure. But uh, but we got it done. Well, that's great. Yeah. That's always a super challenge. So who is who's interested in buying your services? When we look at, at Orbit Fab, we're selling fuel to satellites in orbit. And we talked initially to the commercial customers, these huge numbers, right? There were people of uh, uh, value created. Um, there were some papers put out by researchers about what is the value to the Space Force, and they came back saying $800,000 per kilogram, which is just a staggering, right? But what's driven the demand, because when we started, there was no Space Force, right? It was two years before Space Force was set up. Space Force was set up because of a recognition at the Pentagon that had, space is a contested environment, and it needs specialist folks and expertise. And the first thing they realized was if you're in a contested environment and you can't move out of the way because you don't have enough fuel, you're a sitting duck. All the US's government satellites like and most sensitive national security assets are sitting ducks. That has to be solved. And we find the government is now trying to push the timelines as far to the left as possible. They're trying to accelerate everything to get dynamic space operations, like mobility in any form. Refueling, of course, is the obvious one, but they'll try anything they can. They need to be able to move around in orbit. Um, to, to quote General Shaw, right, I won't operate my satellites like I do today. I will be whizzing around the globe and keeping my adversaries off balance. Right, That's what they want to do. That's the biggest driver bar none right now. The commercial guys, huge money, right? Huge new businesses we can create off the back of this. But the absolute driver in upfront cash is Space Force. Yeah, that is a problem. Uh on it, you know, you can recycle settle. Otherwise, they just run out. They <laughs> run out of juice. It, they're all single use. They're all disposable to replace. Them. You look at, at um, all these mega constellations like Starlink and OneWeb and, and Kuiper. They're talking about replacing the entire constellation cost, for a cost of five or ten billion dollars every five years because they can't refuel them. They can't upgrade them. Like the, the satellite servicing, satellite refueling hasn't existed in the past. Give it a couple of years because all this stuff is being proven out. Right? There's a lot of companies working on this now. All the models of how we operate spacecraft, they'll look more like infrastructure assets in orbit. Right? They'll be maintained, improved, upgraded. That's going to happen. There's going to be a million cell phone towers in orbit, not a million single-use disposable satellites like we're building today. Interesting. So can you talk me through kind of the journey of you know how you deliver fuel you know from you know, the, the manufacturing side all the way through, like, look, here's how you get fuel onto another satellite. The most popular type of fuel is hydrazine, which is, I, I'll admit, it's pretty nasty for humans, but it's it's great for rocket fuel. It, you put it on a catalyst and it, it burns instantly. So you don't need an oxidizer. You just put it on a catalyst. So they make this thing in a batch process, and then we buy whatever a quantity we need from you know a couple of hundred kilos up to a couple of tons. Uh, we put that in a in a tank, typically a, a titanium tank. And trust me, been making big titanium tanks is a pain in the neck. If there's anyone out there who can make us a great a big titanium tank, that would be great. Please call me. So we put it in a big tank and then we attach a little bit of electronics to the side so that we can monitor it. 
and just enough control system so that we can hold it stable. And we put a fueling port on the end and put it in orbit, right? And now we've got a depot. And if you've got an active side, you can come and get that fuel. But of course, nobody wants to put a, a complex, expensive active side on their satellite and have to teach their satellite how to, how to rendezvous docks. So we built a fuel shuttle that's got all of that capability and it can come and grab fuel from the, the, the depot and take the fuel to the customer. And then all the customer has to do is carry a fueling port and the fueling port is you know, about the size of, of this drinking can, right? And it's got a, a, a docking fixture so you can grab onto it and transfer the, the, the propellant at high pressure. And it's got a couple of fluid ports so you can transfer the fuel, but also like blow down gases or purge gases, things like that, in case the auxiliary systems in the spacecraft need some uh, some other things. So there's two fluid ports in there. And that's it. The, the fuel shuttles make the delivery to the clients that have been pre-prepared with the fuel port. Very cool. So is there... How much like uh, would a satellite normally need? How much fuel is it? High quantities or you know a kilogram? It totally, it totally depends on on the size of satellite and the application, right? Some of the the biggest, most sophisticated, most aggressively moved satellites need tons of fuel, like sometimes several tons. But typical satellites that are trying to provide like communications or or Earth observation, they just need to say coordinated with the rest of their satellite network and with things on the on the ground. So. They might, uh, then will have a, a much more modest tank, uh, but still it can be easily 30% of the weight of the spacecraft, uh, especially if they have to do a transition to get to their operational orbit before they can start. Um, so for smaller satellites, that can be just tens of kilograms if the satellite's under 100 kilograms, right? But if it's a one ton satellite, it's going to be a, a couple of hundred kilos of fuel, scales up. How big is your depot or uh, have you modeled it or what is your initial plan? Yeah, we've got a bunch of different designs. Um, the, the depots are sized to get the lowest dollars per kilogram to orbit, right? So we try to fit into the nooks and crannies and get the best deal. Like, do we show up late and fill any excess capacity? Can we can we buy in bulk? Can we take the the, the test vehicle, right? Because the fuel, relative to how much we're selling it for, relative to how much it costs to launch it, which is expensive, the fuel itself is almost free, right? To, the, the hydrazine is distributed by Defense Logistics Agency, it's had a very stable price, and by a long way, it's not our biggest input cost. So we're not, if it blows up, we're not We're not risk sensitive. We manage logistics on orbit. So let's take all the risky launch vehicles, let's figure out whatever we can do to get to orbit the cheapest dollars per kilogram. And that means we size the tanks to the launch to, to optimize that. And sometimes there are standard sizes that different launch companies all sort of agree agreed on. Uh, and so, the 350 kilogram total mass range, that's that's one standard size. Uh, and then above that, it's really custom to the launch vehicle. And then logistically, as that goes up in orbit, you start refueling. What is the plan then when that empties? Is there like a recycle plan with that or? Wish, but there's been no refueling. So no one can run a recycling collection service, right? So people are now planning these as new business models on the back of us succeeding. Uh -huh. And yet... We are yet to prove end to end that the whole thing worked, right? We are under contract with the US government for a 2025 delivery, and that will prove end to end the whole thing works. But until then, these startup companies are predicating their success on a startup company, and that's tricky, right? Once we prove it, it's going to open up so many things, recycling, garbage collection, tugs to move things between different orbits, satellites that can swoop low into the top of the atmosphere, like get closer to the Earth or sample the top of the atmosphere. It's never been possible before because you burn up all your, all your fuel and you're dead in a month, right? Now you can pop up and get more fuel. So all these new business models going out to the moon and back becomes a lot more cost effective when you can refuel and you don't have to ditch your asset every time. Interesting. So are there other other co or competitors or even other countries that I would imagine our adversaries would be very interested in capabilities like this? Yeah, there was a uh, two, two and a half, three years ago, there was a uh, picture came out from a Chinese aerospace conference of a space oil tanker. And uh, we looked at that and went, that looks a little bit like what we're doing. We've got, a, we've got an office of half a dozen people in the UK because the UK and Europe are, are leaning into satellite servicing and refueling. We've got strong relationships with Japanese companies because the Japanese government's also are leaning into this. But most of our, our workforce is here in Colorado because the, the biggest driver has been the US government. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely international interest. And that means that there are other people looking at this as well. We've, we started, you know, we've locked out on the timing. We started a couple of years before Space Force existed and, and you know, four years, four to five years before they finally said, what we need is fuel and now we know how we're going to buy it. 
And so we've got that that head start. We've we've developed our fueling port, like our interface that didn't exist before, and that's getting adopted widely. It's become sort of a de facto standard almost. Yeah, we're in a really good position relative to that expanding market. But now that the government knows has a much clearer signal, a demand signal, everybody else is trying to come at refueling. So game on. That's right. Well, wow. first movers, right? You've then got to leverage it. You got to execute. Yeah, well, you got to keep innovating, right? <laughs> execute and keep innovating. <laughs> So of the current satellites up there for your docking or your uh, adapter, can that be put on existing in-orbit satellites? Is that the plan or is it going to be all new you know, for new builds? We thought about that a lot when we started. And NASA has funded a mission uh, called Restore Rail or OSAM-1. That mission is doing robotic surgery on uh, a NASA spacecraft and, and replacing, like they have a, a valve to fill and drain the, the tanks on the ground, but they're effectively welded shut. Like there's five layers of coverage on them. So they get to cut away the insulation and then cut away the wires that hold the bolts on and undo all the bolts and everything. That's massively expensive. We looked at that. We looked at what they're doing and went, these guys are really smart, but it's never going to be cheap. So we decided that we would only work with pre-prepared you know, fully collaborative spacecraft that have got our fuel import, which means only future spacecraft. But we can work with the companies that are building these these robotic vehicles, and they can deal with the legacy satellites. They make the investments in the complex robotics. They make investments in uh, rendezvous and docking with unprepared clients, and we'll provide them with fuel, which indirectly gets a, a service provider to the legacy satellites. Meanwhile, everything going forward should have a fuel import, and we can go directly to them. And you find you're getting adoption in the uh, market for this refueling port? Yeah, it's been pretty good. I think uh, this month we've got 14 of them going out the door. We expect to sell another 100 this year, which when you consider the number of satellites uh, launched every year, you know, a few years ago it was less than 1,000. Uh, now, thanks to uh, SpaceX launch, extra launch capacity and also the Starlink constellation, I think the number's up closer to 5,000, which is really cool. Um but uh, but yeah, a hundred units is is a substantial fraction of uh, of the satellites getting launched. So that's our goal this year. Is that giving you a unique you know first to market position? You know, with you know becoming the standard for refueling. Absolutely. Look, nobody wants us to lock it in, right? So we're holding that out. We'll probably sign up a couple of companies to manufacture them under contract. Right? If we get a constellation that says we want 10,000 of them, um, we're not equipped to manufacture that, but there are companies that are really good at manufacturing mechanical parts, right? And so we'll qualify somebody else and, and have others manufacture them as well so they'll be available. That helps reduce the friction because everybody now knows if we get hit by a hurricane or if they want 10,000 of them, right, we'll have partners that are able to deliver. So that's you know, we're doing as much as we can to, to reduce the friction and be able to get this into the market because without the fueling ports, we have no market, right? It's the lead indicator for us that we've got a real market in the world. So imagine your first mission, you know, obviously it'll be a huge value proposition and really value realization time. Yeah. Uh, and it, you have done some proof of concept. Can you talk a little bit about that? The first year we founded the company back in 2018, uh, we had the opportunity to fly to the International Space Station, it's the International Space Station National Lab. It's it's a national lab that operates inside the space station, effectively. They're responsible for science and commercialization of of space station and, and low Earth orbit. And so... Uh, they invited us to put some some demonstration payloads up. So we put up two tanker test bits. We pumped water back and forth. We tested the valves. We tested interfaces, uh, some of the electronics, a whole bunch of things. It was really useful. Uh, the, the dynamics of, of tanks, uh, especially because we thought in the future, our customers could launch and then when they're empty, refill the tank. Or they could launch with an empty tank. And if we are really efficient at our logistics chain, we can sell them fuel cheaper on orbit than they could launch it. Uh, but if you launch with an empty tank, you should launch with a stowed tank. And so we developed a, a deployable tank technology. And then we we're able to, to look at the, uh, the slosh dynamics and residual momentum because when you deploy something, it's inevitably flexible. So we we're able to test all of that inside the space station. And then when it was done, we've got this water that we had launched up. It's, it's inside the space station where we're doing these tests with the astronauts. But we said, well, why don't you keep the water? So we became the first private company to resupply the National Space Station with water. And uh, yeah, yeah they're, they're now drinking the water that, that we launched for them. Any big lessons learned from that that you, you know, have been able to take and apply forward? Oh, yeah. Gosh, so many. Um, 
I mean, NASA told us it would take you know, 24 months to get this thing qualified. It turns out if you put a gallon of water on the space station, you can drown an astronaut, right? If it gets on their face, right. they, you can't brush it away because the surface tension will just wrap it back around again. And it's not going to drain. There's no gravity. And you can't yell for help because you're under an inch of water. So it's the, it's dangerous. You just have to be careful. And so NASA said, look, if this is a catastrophic level hazard, right? Oh, and you're going to transfer us the water. You're going to pump water into the water pipes. If you overpressurize the water pipes and burst them, it will leak. And then we may have to evacuate our $100 billion space station. So catastrophic level hazard, this is going to take you two years. So we did it in four and a half months. What we found there, NASA is not unreasonable. They have very reasonable safety concerns, right? Astronaut safety, the space station safety, that that's real. But you, they're also not unreasonable. If you understand what the risk is, if you understand what they're trying to get at, and you respond to it and show how your design either gets around that risk or has enough checks and balances, like enough enough layers of control that the risk is is sufficiently managed, then they're quite happy to sign a waiver to their 1,700-page document of requirements, right? Most of them don't apply for you, and some of them are different. Right? A great example, we did our, you always point an antenna at the payload and see what emissions are coming off, right? Uh, electro, uh, electromagnetic compatibility, electromagnetic interference. And so we did that test at the NASA site rather than trying to figure out how to do it ourselves. So the NASA guy in charge of signing off was the one that did our test for us. And we got this spectrum. And you compare it to the requirements, and we're like, okay, well, it, it, it's got some emissions that exceed the requirements here and here and here. And the guy says, yeah, that requirement, that level is there for a Russian experiment that, that hasn't been used in 10 years, so we can waiver that one. This one's this other thing, and this one's this other. Here's your waivers. We're done. And within a day, we got through something that other companies might have spent months trying to redesign to meet the requirement. The requirements aren't canonical. They're there. If you don't ask the right questions, but meet those requirements, you think we'll be fine. But if you do ask the right questions, you may find that the requirements are, in this case, flexible and can be can be waived. And that was a really big thing. So the reason we were able to go so quickly was because the relationship we built with NASA and the fact that we were, we were willing to listen, understand, and react. But also, we took some risk on ourselves and said, if you don't like this design and tell us we've got to start again, that's our risk. We'll end up having to push the launch. We'll end up having to pay to fix it all. But as long as you like it, let's go. And in the end, they liked it. That's great. Yeah, what a neat partnership to help, you know, through that. Yeah, it's really good. Such a big need. So what is the uh, biggest challenge of building gas stations in space, if you will? What's the biggest challenge of building a company to sell to a market that's never existed before? (laughs) Yeah, exactly that. Nobody believed this was going to be a thing. And it's worse because we, we would have to raise all the money right, to to prove everything works, build a fueling port that's never been built before, or a grappling fixture which has never been built before, on the other passive and active side, prove that it works, put it in orbit, prove that it works. Then everybody could say, okay, great, now, now I have confidence. I want to buy the cheap fueling port part and put it on my satellite and then wait until I run out of fuel. And I'll come back and buy fuel from you in five years' time, right? We get all that capital up front, we have to carry that cost of capital. We get gapped on the revenue. How are we going to survive? And if the market's late or X, Y, Z, right, to, to go out and try and fund that, incredibly difficult. So we are asking our investors to take a bet on the market coming into existence in a reasonable time frame, and us being able to get enough of a first mover advantage that we can get them a good return before everything gets commoditized. That's a, a, quite a bold leap that, that these investors are taking. Now, thankfully, it's exactly what VC exists for. But most VCs are now like, oh, if you have a SaaS play, come and talk to us. Right? They, they, they don't know how to fund hardware startups because hardware is hard. Uh, it, it takes time. It takes money. And yeah, the business models are not always straightforward. And so, yeah, our, our investors are really ones that have understood the industry, understood the opportunity um, that, that we can make. I mean, the, the value creation is just staggering. And, and you've really got to believe in that. That um, And that, that's what our investors do. That's right. Do you have potential customers investing as well that they want this first capability set? Or are they... Our investors include both Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. They've never invested in anything together before. They don't really like investing together. They definitely don't like investing together. Um, 
But we went to them and said, look, we, we would like to bring this capability to market. We think the Space Force are going to adopt this. If it gets adopted as the de facto standard, then all of the requirements for the spacecraft may come out saying you need this fueling port. And if you don't have it, you don't want to be losing billion dollar programs for want of a thirty thousand dollar fueling port. And so they can, they they said, sure, we'll, we'll chip in, we'll we'll lend you our name almost, right, and a, and a bit of money uh, as long as you can guarantee us access. I'm like, oh, deal, game on. But then we got the the world's biggest insurance company, uh, Munich Re. They're the biggest underwriter of satellite launches and 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 operations. They wanted to participate. They led our seed round because they could see how not just refueling but servicing can change the risk profiles. When you've got a $400, $500 uh, million insurance claim, and for want of $20, $30 million of fuel, you could recover it, that's a, that's a lot of a difference in the premium uh, that you're going to be going to be charging. So premiums will change, risk posture will change, new insurance will come up. Like We want to sell fuel for future um, delivery. Those forward contracts, we want to finance them. But the finance companies don't understand operations risk in space. So if we can ensure the operations risk and take that out of the picture, then the financing gets a lot cheaper. And so for us, it's a great partnership with Munich Re. And so you can see that the depth of understanding that these investors have. Um, and then our seed round was led by 8090 Industries. Uh, and this is a fund that was uh, put together by the Osman family who own Sierra Space and Sierra Nevada. And they brought in like great American industrialists, Koch Brothers, Ross Perot Jr., what have you, like, great access. But fundamentally, the, the, the people that, that drive that fund understand the aerospace industry and they totally see what this is going to do. This is going to revolutionize how space operations happen and the position that we could get in if we if we pull this off and make it work, uh, becoming almost kingmakers on what fuels are going to be used in orbit, what thrusters are going to be used in orbit, where people are going to be able to get fuel and those kinds of things. So yeah, we have some of the most sophisticated investors in the world. It's been phenomenal. Yeah, that's amazing. Just even putting together that to walk people through that journey, investors through that journey is a an amazing feat in and of itself. <laughs> Never mind but actually course, the technology. But of course, a startup, right? To get to a Series A, I think I had to walk 295 investors through that story and getting to one yes. That is uh, the fun part of the startup, the fundraising time. So in running this, I mean, you're super, super innovative company, team idea. What's the key thing about your team makeup that you think makes this possible to turn, you know, instead of two years, four months, like what are your key tenants within your company that keep this innovative mindset fresh? It's a conundrum, right? Because we need to move fast. We need to have just that open mindset, leave no stone unturned, trying to find a way to move quicker. Constantly trade requirements. And the textbooks will tell you there's no such thing as a should requirement. It's shall or it doesn't exist, right? It's very binary. And I think that there's nothing worse in the engineering education system than how they teach systems engineers. Because in my mind, every requirement has value. Sometimes the value is overwhelming, but most of the time it can be traded, right? What if I only got you half the fuel on a delivery? Well, you might have to make two deliveries. That's a pain in the neck. That's expensive. Yeah, but my thing gets smaller. Let me trade it, right? right. It's not a canonical requirement. What if it's a third? What if I had 200% more, right? Let me trade that. Everything's a trade. Can I go faster? Can I get the experience? Because we don't know what we're doing yet. Can I learn quicker? These things are, are really key right now. And so we have to be a little cowboy and always be flying. But when we produce a valve, that valve is going on possibly a multi-billion dollar national security asset. That valve cannot fail. So now reconcile this. I have to move fast and I have to produce a product that's absolutely reliable. This is the tension constantly in the company. And you've got to ask people coming in the door, can you hold both of these states in your mind simultaneously and not explode it? That's, that's been the toughest thing is, is doing exactly that. Yeah, that, that is an interesting and unique challenge <laughs> to keep it going that fast uh, with something that important. And, and a lot of it is like train the young people on, on this kind of thinking and, and that kind of stuff. We end up with an absolutely phenomenal team. That whatever some of them end up doing, like we'll... we'll have some people leave, they're going to end up running some of the, the more interesting parts of the space industry just because of the experience they're getting here. I can only imagine. How do you then, within your company, handle you know security of IP, cybersecurity, uh, especially now as you're working with you know the defense industrial base and DOD mandates coming down? How, how, are you, how do you look at that challenge? That challenge is real. 
we've addressed that at a at a few different levels, right? When we when we started, we were a lot looser. We didn't have the time to focus on it. So we've had a gradual progression over time of tightening up our systems. Um, but also then our engagement with the the more sensitive customers has been a, a gradual thing over time ramping up. So we're not we're not holding classified information yet and we haven't gone down that route. But when we will, we'll isolate that from the rest of the company and set up those systems. Uh, but now we have contracts that require us to be CMMC compliant. And so we've had to learn what that is and bring on people that are that are expert in that. We've had to switch our IT systems. Google is out, Microsoft is in. Every engineer is really annoyed. Uh, yeah. But we have to explain why this is important and why what we're doing and some of the missions that we're on are of interest to some very persistent prying eyes with some very sophisticated tools. And unfortunately, we're going to compromise in some ways so that we can feel a little more secure in what we deliver to the customer, right? In in that, in our ability to protect the things that make the company valuable. And so in the end, it's like the communication to the team, super, super important. And of course, we've got to keep obsessing about, are we, are we bringing on tools that are usable? Or are we like, what is that balance between slowing the team down and protecting what we have? And how do we have to shift that balance over time? Yeah, I think that's a great perspective. Uh, cause it, do, it, it does matter and there are prying eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you try from, you know, day zero of, of a you know, two or three person company to implement everything, you won't get anywhere. That's so it. that's, that's the challenge is when do you decide to, to turn on greater levels of security? So what do you think is critical for your company to remain on this leading edge of innovation, uh, to continue, uh, to strive? You've got your big milestones here, but you know, what, what's next? So what are you going to do? To continue that, I mean, let me paint you the vision of the company, right? Because we're not we're not here just to deliver gas. It's a great tagline, gas stations in space, but yeah. we want to be the chemical supplier of choice for the space industry. And as you get manufacturing in orbit, right? Manufacturing without gravity is really cool. Uh, my best analogy is like manufacturing without pressure. You get a vacuum pump, you can pull pressure in air, have a jar with no air. What do you do with it? Well, everything, all right, from from freezing, freeze drying to to vacuum packing to refrigeration. So I vacuum tubes at one point. Vacuum is so important to industry. If you can take out gravity, huge change, right? Now you can you got no buoyancy, you got no internal stresses. You can make materials you can never make before. You can combine materials you could never combine before. You can store things without them touching walls. There's going to be a huge manufacturing thing. We want to be the industrial chemical supply company to that industry as the in-space economy grows over the next 50 years to rival the size of the earth economy. We want to be Dow Chemical, Exxon, something like that, right? Refineries, yeah. storage, distribution, sales of, of all types of chemicals. That's where we want to go. So right now it's focused on storage, distribution, sales. Give me five or 10 years, we're going to be working on the refinery car. Right? First, just a couple of chemical processes. So we can launch one feedstock and turn it into two or three things. And then we can take offtake agreements, waste products, or the first materials coming back from the moon or, or asteroids, put those into a process that generates products that people want to buy and use in space. That's the future that, that we want to build. So right now, we build gas caps. Right? Right. <laughs> right now, we build gas caps. In 2025, we want to be pumping the first gas in orbit, right? Build that network up. By the end of the decade, we want that propellant, you know, multiple propellant types in multiple different orbits to be available. And beyond that, it's about building refineries and building a, a massive chemical supply company. Very cool. Uh, that's going to be awesome to see. <laughs> uh, we, definitely well underway. Just uh, imagine what it all enable, right? At the moment, getting material in orbit is, it's impossible. But when you can get it, the businesses that people will build on this will be staggering. How much just out of curiosity, you know, Elon Musk, SpaceX and his vision to go to the moon. And, you know, a lot of folks have that vision of, you know, starting to, I would think they would be super interested in your capability without this, you know, or what you guys uncover and allow to be innovative, innovative are going to, it's going to change a lot of what I imagine they assume the future would be because there's so much unknown that you guys can help with. Are they, have you con connected with a lot of them and talked to some of these other innovators in space that are like, what's their thought? Some of them get it and some of them are invested. Almost universally positive, right? Everyone's waiting to see what it's going to enable. 
but also everyone's working on their vision of the future and they're part of that vision. So Elon wants to get to Mars, right? He wants to, what does he famously say? He wants to die on Mars, just not on landing. Right. Um, <laughs> and so the things he's working on are things that will get SpaceX to Mars. Jeff Bezos has a, a vision that's more aligned with mine, actually, people living outside of gravity well for obtaining habitats and things. So he's also fallen in love with the moon lately. That may be because maybe because there's a lot of money attached to the moon right now. But um, there are there are a lot of people that have similar visions for a bustling in space economy. And everybody's working a small piece. And this is like the ecosystem that is slowly growing so that we're going to have garbage collection, refineries, um, uh, recycling, all these types of things, these will get built and so many other things besides, right? The export industries are going to be tourism, mining, uh, entertainment content. Let's go see a sports game or a concert in space. That sounds sounds like it could be interesting. Eventually, we're, we're going to have, uh, of course, manufacturing. We, we're going to have hotels in orbit because the pressure on your heart is less. And you're probably going to end up with, with medical and retirement facilities on orbit. Like I said, in the next 50 years, the economy in orbit is going to be bigger than the economy on Earth. Every industry will be operating in space. That's that's the potential. And so many people right now are working on tiny little pieces of this. Some people have bigger visions. Uh, yeah, I want to supply all of it. Yeah, well, it sounds like almost the glue or the you know architecture that allows for a lot of this to happen. Yep. <laughs> Yep. So our current orbits, I mean, they're going to get crowded if we don't have the ability to move and change. Is it absolutely right? Next mission is uh, 25, you said. Is that correct? 2025 is the first delivery uh, of, uh, of fuel to the U.S. government. Any other big milestones between now and then, or is that really your uh, the final we, for the, the next one? We've target? got three flight systems that we're working on because uh, we, we want to have lot of, lots of bites at that cherry, right? Always be prepared in case the first one doesn't work or the second one doesn't work, right? So we got three bites of that cherry, and that's not enough for me. The business development team are out there trying to get support for a, a fourth bite of that. Those will launch between now and, and, and that sort of delivery late 2025. Um, but we've got 100 fueling ports we're selling this year. We've got the active side of that, flight qualification and delivery by the end of the year. Um, yeah, huge bunch of milestones that are that are coming up. All leading up to that, yeah, the, the the big finale of the test, of course, is deliver the first drop of fuel to a customer. Oh, can't wait! Definitely going to have that on the calendar when it's uh, <laughs> when you can share it because that will be super fun to watch. Well, all right. Well, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we're going to have today before we wrap up. But if people want to follow, you know, your amazing mission and company, where can they go to learn more and continue to engage? You can go to our website, orbitfab.com. Uh, look us up on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. We're, we're most active, I think, on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, all, always looking for great people, engineers especially, but just across the board, business development and, and all the functions of running a company. Um, so encourage people to to apply, especially if you're here in Colorado. Uh, you know, let's, let's pump some gas. Let's pump some gas. All right. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, and I appreciate your time and joining us today. Thanks, David. Cheers. Take care. 